Well, welcome everybody. Um, sorry that I don't get to talk to you all in person. I was looking forward to having that uh, engaging discussion today at Mountain View High School, but I understand that uh, COVID is on the prowl again, so we have to kind of change things up a little bit in terms of how we deliver this training to you. Uh, but uh, my name is Craig Durrell. I am a sergeant with the Ada County Sheriff's Office and I am coming to you from the Cascade Student Transportation offices. Um, obviously, it's a lot easier to engage with you when I'm in front of you and answering questions and all of that. So the training will probably feel a little bit more sterile and clinical today, plus I'm sitting down, so um, I'm sure that looks a little weird. But um, the important thing is, is I want to get the information out to you, and then at the very end, you'll see my contact information and you are always welcome to call me or email me with any additional questions that you have. Uh, if you have scenario-based questions or, or specific things that you want to talk to, I'm always help, happy to take your phone calls and talk that through. Um, but today we're going to talk a little bit about the Idaho Standard uh, Command Responses for Schools. But before that, uh, I got waylaid as I was introducing myself, but I'm the School Resource Officer Sergeant for the Ada County Sheriff's Office. I worked for the Sheriff's Office uh, since 1992 in a variety of positions, but I have been the SRO Sergeant there for the last four years, uh, going on my fifth school year, and work closely with uh, my SRO counterparts at the Meridian Police Department. And so the training that you're gonna get today is exactly the way uh, Meridian Police uh, trains their school staff as well. So you'll see uh, similar um, responses, similar discussion vocabulary, between the two different agencies so it won't really matter if you're involved with a school in Meridian jurisdiction or if you're involved with a school in a jurisdiction that we take care of at the sheriff's office so back to the training today it's the Idaho standard command responses for schools and the objectives the learning objectives for uh, today's training is I want you to understand the urgent need for a common response protocols to schools uh, I want you to be able to detail uh, this, or talk in detail about the Idaho Standard Command Responses for Schools and, and what that is. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the importance of developing common understanding of vocabulary that we use uh, in ISCRS. And uh, since Idaho Standard Command Responses for Schools is really long, I'll refer to that as ISCRS through probably most of the training. Going to define the roles and responsibilities in the ISCRS protocol for uh, administrators, teachers, staff, and students, and also help you understand how these responses are incorporated into school existing school emergency plans. So the other issue is you're probably saying, okay, well, I don't necessarily work in the school. I'm a bus driver, but the important thing is, is I want you to understand if there is an emergency at school, I want you to understand how the school and law enforcement is going to respond to that. Um, for example, um, there's a lot of data that's come out on shootings that have occurred in schools and uh, it's interesting to note that a lot of shootings happen first thing in the morning. A lot of those hostile events that happen in a school happen first thing in the morning and so there is uh, a possibility that there is some type of uh, emergency or active shooter situation going on at a school while you guys are lined up uh, either dropping off or picking up students and so you're there and you may end up getting pulled into that so it's important for you guys to know what that uh, response is going to look like at the school level uh, the so with iscrs the actions a school community takes uh, in the initial moments of an incident are key to protecting lives and property and so we're going to talk today about the responses that schools are going to take in those very initial moments of uh, some type of an emergency situation at school uh, this program offers a limited common highly effective group of initial responses to the majority of school threats. It's designed for K through 12 by uh, Idaho educators and emergency responders. And um, the so the issue, just kind of give you a little bit of the background, and I'm gonna try not to speak directly from the slides. I know that you're gonna have these and nobody wants to have a, a speaker that speaks specifically 
or read specifically off of a PowerPoint slide. So I don't want to do that. Um, and there's a lot of information on there that you guys can review um, on your own time. But to give you a little bit of a background of where ISCRS came from, it, um, over time we started to see a trend that different school districts responded differently to uh, school threats that were happening on campus. Um, they had different responses, they had different terminology, different vocabulary, and it was also, uh, it also varies a lot, um, not only just within uh, schools within a school district, uh, but also within school districts here in the Treasure Valley, but also throughout the state of Idaho. And so uh, we have initially what we call the Treasure Valley School Safety Committee. Uh, formed where we had a pool of law enforcement from different law enforcement agencies, uh, educators from all of the school districts here in Ada County, um, Ada County Emergency Management, a lot of other partners and collaborator, collaborators came together to develop what is now known as the uh, Idaho Standard Command Responses for Schools. Uh, and so this is designed that for any student, for any teacher, no matter what school you end up going to or transferring to, here in the Treasure Valley, you're gonna get trained to respond to a threat on campus in the same way. Uh, these responses have also been picked up by school districts throughout the state of Idaho and in other states uh, in uh, the Northwest. Uh, and it's our goal to continue to push and train this out so that we have this common response uh, no matter where you go to school or work. Um, so, The thing also that I really want to kind of um, get you guys to think about today is how important mental preparation is and how that is a key to a successful response um, if something bad does happen. And so uh, we, we do it in law enforcement all the time. For example, uh, if one of my uh, deputies uh, checks out on a traffic stop and I hear the location, I hear where he's at um, in the vehicle he checks out on, I automatically start thinking about, okay, if something really bad happens, um, how am I gonna get to that scene quickly? Where are all of my other clear units? How am I gonna direct them in? What are my next steps gonna be? How am I gonna manage that incident? And of course, that usually never happens, but I always like to be prepared. And so I know that over the course of a year, you can, it's probably really easy to get a little apathetic and get into just the daily routine and rut of your job where you know you're picking your kids up you're driving into school you're dropping them off then you're picking up from school and then you're driving them home and then dropping them off and when you do that every day um, sometimes you lose that situational awareness of everything that's going on around you and so it's really important when you have some free time to think through okay if Somebody came onto my bus right now and had a gun, what would I do? If I was parked in front of uh, Mountain View High School and I'm waiting to pick up kids at the end of the school day and I see a kid walking into the school with a gun, what, do I, what would I do and who would I call? And if you think through those scenarios ahead of time when the something does happen and the adrenaline starts flowing and you want to kind of freeze up, you've already kind of thought through all of those different scenarios and you're, you're more prepared to respond uh, in, a, in a successful way. Uh, so again, good decisions in an emergency are built on active awareness and we'll talk about situational awareness um, in the training today. So it's really important to use all your senses um, to stop, look, listen, smell, and feel. And if you perceive that you are in a dangerous situation, uh, then it's okay to alter your response to what you're doing at the moment, adapt, and then respond accordingly. And then we also tell teachers that they're empowered to make decisions based on their observations and circumstances. And so this training, this protocol is option-based. And so we're gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we want schools to do if there's an emergency on campus or what, how you might play into that. But we do this from the perspective of you, know, you always have options. And so we're gonna give you guidelines, but as the situation unfolds, you may, find that you need to operate outside of those guidelines because, uh, because of the circumstances that you find yourself in. And so it's really important for you to understand that um, you need to do ultimately what's in the best interest of you and your kids. And that's the direction that we want you to move um, toward in an emergency.
Uh, we teach that movement is critical in all four of the Idaho Standard Command responses for schools. Um, there's four responses and we'll talk about what those are. Um, but we want you to move away from danger to a place of safety. So in every one of these responses, the first thing that you're thinking about is moving away from danger and moving to a place of safety. So that could be moving off the bus to a place that's more secure. That could be moving the bus with the kids on it to a place away from where the threat is if the threat's on the school campus. Or wherever you find yourself at, if there is a threat, it's all about moving away from that threat to a place of safety. That's the first thing that you always wanna think about is okay, there's a threat, there's some kind of a, uh, something going on that I am immediately exposed to or the kids that are with me are exposed to. Where am I gonna go and where am I gonna take these kids um, where they're safe? Um, when you move, we teach that we want people to move with the intention and uh, with intention and purpose and they're moving from transition point to transition point. For instance, uh, if there was a situation in a school and let's say we had a threat in a hallway and we have a teacher with her students and they're trying to get from a place that's not safe to a place that's safe. Uh, what we teach is that instead of just blindly running down the hall, not paying attention to uh, everything that's going on around you, it's really important to have situational awareness and to move from transition point to transition point. So for instance, the first transition point would be your classroom and then let's say you're trying to get to an exterior door at the end of the hallway and you're going to leave the school and go out that way so every cross hallway that you would come to um, that would perhaps be another transition point where you would stop the teacher would look is there a threat is there any other issues uh, going on around me and then eventually they're trying to get to that point where they can exit and move to a place of safety so instead of again blindly running or if you're outside at your school bus instead of just getting out of the bus and then running intentionally being aware of everything that's going on around you kind of identifying where you're trying to go and then finding those those safe zones to stop and kind of look and listen as you're moving to that place of safety uh, and so stopping at each transition point reassessing and then proceeding if reasonable adapting if necessary is really important uh, in a, uh, a situation like this so here are the this uh, and so every West Ada school also is taught this so the four responses are evacuation reverse evacuation hall check and a lockdown and then we're going to go through each of those I'm going to explain to you what those look like and then um, yeah and then we'll go from there so uh, the first one is evacuation and this is what was more commonly referred to as a fire drill back in the day. Um, we don't necessarily say fire drill anymore. We say evacuation drill, and it could be for, uh, for a fire alarm or something like that. But essentially an evacuation drill is removing students and staff from a dangerous situation inside a building to a place of safety outside of the building. And uh, as is indicated in the PowerPoint, this is generally signaled by a fire alarm system that might be going off, or it could be signaled by an address over the PA system announcing the need to evacuate the building. When a school evacuates the building, if you're, you happen to be there and you're, you're hearing, the, the, hearing the PA or you're waiting for students and you see all the kids running out, there's usually, um, from the administrator or the principal or the principal's designee, um, there would be a comment uh, or a, a, an announcement made, evacuate the building, evacuate the building, evacuate the building. And so at this point, teachers organize their classes, they gather, um, the kids can gather coats if it's cold, uh, emergency plot, so, excuse me, emergency supplies, uh, and then they're gonna move students out of the building. And with an evacuation drill, it's really important um, for our school staff to know that speed is not the goal. And so the goal isn't to get them out as quickly as possible. Um, for those of you, um, and me included, if you remember back in the day when you were kids and, and you would, uh, the fire drill would go off and then sometimes there would be somebody there even with a, a stopwatch. But the goal was how fast could the teacher get the kids from the classroom to the parking lot. 
And so we don't teach that anymore. Our schools are really well made. The, the chance of some explosive fire growth or something that's gonna happen, even if there was a legitimate fire um, that would impact the students is pretty, pretty limited. Uh, and uh, the, the risk of a, of a child fatality in a school fire is extremely, extremely low. I think there's only been maybe one or two uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. So um, speed is not the goal. We want movement to be safe, controlled, and intentional. Once the, the teacher gets the students out of the building, they're escorted to an assembly point. And at that point, the teacher is going to do a positive accounting and they're gonna go through their roster and make sure all of their kids are present. Uh, students and staff can reoccupy the evacuated building when it's declared safe by proper authority and approved by the, the school principal or designee. Uh, and again, teachers are authorized to adapt their response based on any observed conditions. For example, uh, for a fire evacuation, uh, if it's a fire drill and the alarm goes off, they may know that, hey, when there's a, a fire alarm that goes off at the school, I need to take my students from my classroom to this exit door, and this is the way that we're going to go out. However, as they're going and they're using intentional movement, they see a safety hazard, or they see smoke, they see fire, uh, something they can adapt and obviously go through uh, a different part of the school and exit a different way. Uh, once all the students and everybody are outside at their assembly point, the teachers will have a card. One uh, side of the card will be red and one side of the card will be green. Um, once all of the students out, if all of the students in that classroom are accounted for, the teacher will hold up the green card. If she's missing somebody and doesn't have a full counting of her students, she'll hold up the red card and then we'll know that we need to find that missing student that is from her class. Um, things to think about, uh, and especially if you're there and, and you hear a fire alarm going off, school fire alarms have been activated intentionally and unintentionally during other types of emergencies and not emergencies. It is very common for a fire alarm to be activated in an active shooter scenario. Uh, this has happened for a different, couple of different reasons. Um, there have been a couple of incidents where the shooter themselves has activated the fire alarm um, but in the majority of instances the fire alarm has sounded because another student has activated the alarm to evacuate the school um, because they have seen the threat or the, the active shooter or just gunfire within the school has created enough smoke and things like that um, or IEDs have been set off where it's created smoke that set off the fire alarm but the important thing that we teach um, our teachers is that when the fire alarm sounds, the other thing that we also do is uh, we try to have an administrator go out and do a quick check around the school just to make sure everything looks good. Again, speed is not the goal. We wanna make sure that the kids are safe leaving the school and if it is a fire alarm, especially if it's a pull alarm. So we teach our staff to go to the office, um, determine is this a, a fire alarm from a pull station or is it an alarm that's activated from like an O2 sensor or something like that in the kitchen because that makes a big difference. We treat the pole stations a little bit differently. We're more careful uh, about that. And then also we do have uh, a new response plan in place uh, in the city of Meridian. They're still testing it out. It hasn't uh, gone west statewide in terms of all other jurisdictions, but in the city of Meridian for all uh, unplanned fire alarms, uh, police officers are dispatched code three lights and sirens to that school to make sure everything is safe. Uh, and so if you see police cars showing up with lights and sirens and officers getting out with guns and things like that on a fire alarm, it's because they're just making sure that um, there aren't any other nefarious circumstances that are surrounding that alarm. Um, Situational awareness response options are critically important. Evacuation by definition involves moving through potentially dangerous areas, and all staff need to be aware of and evaluating their surroundings during the evacuation. Uh, before moving students into an unknown area, we ask the adults to, to quickly assess the area for hazards, and if hazards are noted um, and they have to diff take a different route, then um, we want them to feel empowered to do that. So the 
Next thing I'm going to show you is the evacuation procedure demonstration. This is The demonstration you're about to watch is an evacuation, one of the Idaho Standard Command responses for schools. An evacuation is intended to remove students and staff from dangerous situations inside a building. Please note that a fire drill is only one specific type of evacuation. School evacuations may be necessary for several hazards, such as a medical response or hazardous materials. This evacuation protocol is also a general guideline. School personnel are authorized to adapt the response based upon their observed conditions. And we're going to talk a little bit today about spectroscopy. Olivia, can you read the uh, introduction paragraph right there for me? Uh, everybody, please gather your essentials. Let's line up at the classroom door. The evacuation command response is generally signaled by the activation of a building fire alarm system or a PA announcement. Teachers will organize their class with weather appropriate clothing as available and take their emergency supplies, including a student roll for taking attendance to the relocation point. I don't see any hazards or issues with our planned evacuation route, so please follow me calmly and quietly. Before moving students, school personnel should quickly assess the area and their intended evacuation route for any hazards. In some situations, school personnel may notice a potential hazard or impediment to a planned evacuation route. Well, hold on. Uh, this terrible is full of smoke. we got to take them out that way. Okay, okay, everybody, hold on. Our route is blocked. We're headed this way to our alternate route. Follow me, please. Joven? Once students have arrived safely at the pre-designated location, Olivia. teachers or school staff will ensure all students under their supervision are accounted for. Travis? Here. In the demonstration you just observed, you should note that the speed of the evacuation was not the highest priority. Intentional movement, situational awareness, and understanding all available options for a safe evacuation process were more critical. All right, so I'm back. So uh, you should have seen the video by now, and uh, that's essentially what an evacuation procedure demonstration uh, should look like. And we will move on to the next command response, which is a reverse evacuation. And so if you are at a school or you hear this ongoing, uh, reverse evacuation is simply removing students and staff from outside the building to inside the building. Uh, where an evacuation is that the threat or the issue is inside the building, we're getting everybody out. The reverse evacuation is that the threat or the dangerous situation is outside the building and we're getting everybody in. Um, if, well, I'll talk to you a little bit about how, what that looks like and if you are on a school campus and a reverse evacuation is called for while you're in the process of loading or unloading students, what that should look like. So. If there is a reverse evacuation, an audible notification, it could be a horn, a whistle, an alarm over the PA, something to that effect, uh, will be activated. And there'll be information that's broadcast out over the PA system if the school has one. Um, it could be a teacher with a bullhorn out in the parking lot. But essentially, they will announce return to the building three times. Then they will move all student, staff, and visitors. And if you're there, it would include you into the building as quickly as possible. And then we'll have students and teachers return to their classroom. Uh, other people will, uh, will have them go to designated areas, could be in the office or the cafeteria or the gym. Uh, and then essentially there will be information that's uh, provided as to why that reverse evacuation is taking place. Normally it could be um, that there's some type of emergency law enforcement response uh, involving a dangerous situation outside the school in the vicinity of the school, so we want to get everybody in quickly. It could be uh, an impending weather emergency uh, where we want to get people into the school quickly. Uh, it could be something as um, simple as an aggressive pit bull on the playground and uh, we're having a hard time with that and maybe a bit of kid and so we're trying to get everybody into the school quickly. 
but the issue, whereas like uh, an evacuation out of the building is a little bit more, speed isn't an issue. The reverse evacuation, while speed isn't necessarily the number one thing that we look for, um, we do want to get people into the school as, uh, as quickly as possible. Students will return to the classrooms and then the teacher, like they do when the, there's an evacuation, on a reverse evacuation, the teacher will take a roster of uh, their class and make sure all of their kids are there. And then that information gets conveyed to the office. And so if there are any kids missing, then we can identify them and go look for them. Uh, so real quickly, a reverse evacuation is typically, um, if it's connected to a police emergency outside the school, a reverse evacuation is going to probably tie in to another command response that we're going to talk about, whether it's a hall check or a lockdown, and I'll identify what those are and what they mean, but um, that that could potentially happen uh, where we're moving kids into the school, where we, we're going to lock all of the, the exterior doors and kind of control student movement in the school while the emergency out, outside kind of is taken care of. So with that, uh, here is a video for a reverse evacuation. The demonstration you are about to watch is a reverse evacuation, one of the Idaho standard command responses for schools. Reverse evacuations remove students and staff from dangerous situations outside a building, such as extreme weather, a neighborhood police incident, or a dangerous animal. Regardless of the situation, a reverse evacuation requires moving back into the building quicker than your regular processes allow. An audible alarm, the public address system, or some other form of auditory notification will signal the need to return to the building. Attention all staff, return to the building, return to the building, return to the building. Okay, everybody, back in the building, let's go. During a reverse evacuation, students and teachers should return to their classrooms or other designated areas. At the same time, any visitors to the school will be directed to the main office to help ensure accountability. All right, let me feel about this. Find your seats, thanks for coming in so quickly. Once inside the classroom, teachers will take attendance and await further instruction. Here. Cambry. Here. A reverse evacuation is different than your regular processes for moving students into a building. A unique type of notification is needed to alert students and school staff to return to the safety of the building immediately. A reverse evacuation will be followed by additional actions that teachers and staff will be directed to take. It is a command to get inside a building, account for all students, and await further instruction. All right, so the next uh, command response that I want to talk to you about uh, is a hall check. And um, that may sound kind of weird. Essentially, a hall check is very similar to what you may have heard uh, referred to as a shelter in place. And what a hall check is designed to do is to detect and uh, protect against potential threats while allowing the instructional process to continue. And a hall check, as the other two uh, command responses um, were initiated, a hall check is initiated in the same way where there's an announcement made. Hall check uh, is stated three times over the PA. Uh, when people in the school and staff and students hear that, uh, they know that there's some type of unusual situation or circumstance that's going on in the school and the, the principal or the admin team wants to restrict student movement and keep everybody in their classrooms. 
So hall check does not have the, the level of concern uh, that would initiate a lockdown drill, but there's still something that's not going on that's, that's quite right, and we don't want students leaving the school, we don't want students in the hallways, things like that. So when a hall check is called, students return with urgency to their assigned classrooms or designated areas. A teacher will observe the immediate area for any suspicious circumstance or unauthorized persons. And then if they do see any circumstances or unusual issues or unauthorized people in the school, they'll report that, report that to the office. They'll get the students into the classroom and they'll lock the doors. Uh, teachers account for all of their students, as in the other scenarios. And then they're prepared to, uh, for further instructions to kind of know what to do and what's, what happens next. Um, once all of the kids are secure in the classroom on a hall check, the teachers can continue teaching and instructing, um, but we do want the students remaining in the classroom. Um, students will be allowed to use the restrooms um, as soon as possible, and we'll make that announcement to let them know when, when that student movement can happen. But initially, we want everybody staying in the classroom. Uh, couple of different scenarios that could um, cause a hall check to happen. Uh, it could be something like somebody sees uh, a person in the school that does not appear to be a staff member or a teacher and they don't recognize them and so they think that maybe there's an unauthorized person in the school. Isn't necessarily posing a threat but they report that to the office uh, and we want to try to find out who that person is so we can call a hall check. Um, or it could be something um, as simple as there is a student having a seizure in a hallway and we don't want uh, a passing period to happen and all of these kids walking by. Or maybe we're calling for paramedics. Or maybe there's a parent that's uh, having an aggressive conversation with uh, the principal in the office. And so we want everybody to kind of stay safe and we want to keep the hallways clear. So that's kind of what a hall check is. And uh, if you're ever on campus and hear that, that's kind of uh, the process that's going to take place. And here is the video uh, that has been put together to demonstrate to you what a hall check will look like in the real world. The demonstration you are about to watch is a hall check, one of Idaho's standard command responses for schools. A hall check enables a school to increase its awareness of a potential threat or hazard inside the building by stopping all movement, securing students in a safe location, and detecting any odd or unusual circumstances. A hall check is an initial response that moves the school population to a safe place while enabling instruction and educational activities to continue. Janet, a teacher just reported that we have a stranger walking around the hallways. Oh, then we better call for a hall check. Hall check, hall check, attention please, hall check. Everybody inside, come on. During a hall check, students, school personnel, and all authorized visitors should secure themselves in their assigned classroom or other designated area. Teachers and staff should observe their immediate area for suspicious circumstances or unauthorized persons and report anything they notice out of the ordinary. Classroom doors are locked and teachers will account for all students in their class. During a hall check, any visitors to the school will be directed to the main office to help ensure accountability. Emerson? Here. Once all students are accounted for, classroom or other school activities may resume unless instructed otherwise by the principal or principal's designee. The hall check will be released by the principal or principal's designee after all teachers, staff, students, and school visitors have been secured and the school grounds have been checked for any odd or unusual activity. Note that once students are secure in a classroom or other designated area, more specific instructions may be provided to modify the hall check command. For example, students may access certain areas of the building, such as restrooms or the cafeteria, while keeping the hallways generally clear. 
Once in place, the release of a hall check and return to normal operations is only indicated by the principal or principal's designee. The last command response that I want to talk to you about is probably the one that you're most familiar with. Uh, it's the one that generates the, the most news, uh, the, you know, all of the bad stuff that we hear about when we talk about emergencies in schools, and that is lockdown. And a lockdown is, that's exactly what it is, is we're locking down that school, we're locking down all of the students and staff in that school in a safe place because there is a very significant threat um, to the staff and to the students that's ongoing in the school um, that's imminent and it's designed to keep everybody as safe as possible. And we use the move, secure, defend terminology. You may have heard it uh, in other trainings or in the past as run, hide, fight. Uh, and so in the course of defining this, um, we, you know, we heard from educators that the words that we use to tell you what you need to do, um, that we need to be really specific with that. Uh, and so as we talked about it, we came up with Move, Secure, Defend. And the Move, Secure, Defend model describes protective actions taken by adults to keep large groups of children safe when implementing the ISCRS lockdown protocol. And the Move, Secure, Defend uh, process is something that you would utilize as well if there was an emergency in um, or around your bus. So again, as we talk about in all of these situations and scenarios, the first thing that we want you to do when there is a safety issue, there's danger and you need to take immediate action uh, the first thing that you need to think about is I need to move. I need to move away from the danger and I need to move to a place that's safe. And I'm going to use a series of intentional, highly aware uh, movements where safety and not speed is the goal. So whether that's an issue in the school, in the parking lot, on your bus, the first thing that you want to do is you want to move away from danger to a place of safety because if there's a bad guy with a gun and he's in this office and he's shooting, if I'm not in this office, then I'm going to be safe. Uh, and so my goal would be to leave the office and get away as quickly as possible or leave the bus or leave the school. And so the first thing that we teach our, our teachers and our, our school staff is that if you can get away from the school that is your best option and so we ask them to think through uh, uh, predetermined locations where if they have to leave the campus that they're going to take their students to this spot and sometimes it could be a park in the neighborhood it could be a church it could be houses on a different street um, but the first thing that you want to do is move away from the threat if you cannot do that, so, so I'm here at the Cascade Student Transportation offices and I'm teaching in this classroom, and if a threat presents itself in the hallway and I cannot get out the door, uh, and then I'm in this office, so then the next thing, my be next, next best option, uh, and it doesn't look like the window's open, so I can't go out the windows, so my next best option is to secure myself in this classroom. And so teachers and staff should secure spaces quickly and completely with the emphasis not on hiding, but on physically preventing entry into the secured space. You know, you think about way back at the beginning, you think about Col um, Columbine, where teachers were, or students were hiding under desks uh, or tables in the library. Um, those were not safe spaces. And so when we talk about hiding we're really talking about securing find a safe space and secure it to the best of your ability so in this particular office that i'm in the door has a lock so i'm gonna first thing i'm gonna do is i'm gonna lock the door uh, there's this great big table here that i'm probably gonna put up against the door there's a bunch of chairs and file cabinets and things like that i'm gonna basically barricade myself in this office 
I'm going to close the blinds. I'm going to turn the lights off. I'm going to be as quiet as possible. But I'm going to create a lot of barriers and prevent the bad guy with the gun who's in the hallway from coming in here. And that's what we're teaching um, our school staff to do as well. And then the last thing is, is if I can't move away from the threat and I'm in a position where I'm out in the open and I can't secure myself, and unfortunately, uh, as a school bus driver, if, you're, if the threat presents itself on the bus, you may go right past move and secure and your right to defend because you have uh, a threat that is in right in front of you. And so now you've got to figure out what to do with that. So when we talk about defending yourself, defending the students on your bus or in your classroom, uh, it's not uh, a provocative or uncontrolled action. Instead, we want you to defend your students and yourselves, uh, and then understand that defense should be the, the last available option. Um, but if you get to the point where this is where you're at, and we talk about this is an option-based training uh, where you find yourself, I can't move away from the threat, I can't secure myself, I've got to deal with it, we want you to engage very aggressively and very quickly. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on it at the end of the training, but in law enforcement, we're taught that action beats reaction. And what that means is in a training scenario, I could have my gun out with simunition rounds in it and I'm pointing it at my target who has a gun out down at their sides. If that person that I'm pointing my gun at decides to lift their gun and shoot me before I decide to pull the trigger, they'll probably shoot me every single time, even though my gun's already pointed directly at them. Uh, and there are a ton of videos online if you research action versus reaction when it comes to like fights and punching and things like that. But point being is make the decision about what you what you're going to do and then then act. And if the threat is in front of you, you acting aggressively and quickly, even if the gun is pointed in your face, you're going to, uh, your action is going to beat their reaction every single time. So we want that defense to be quick and to be aggressive. So when it comes to lockdown, any staff member may initiate a lockdown for imminent or occurring threats. You, uh, as a school bus monitor or a school bus driver, have the authority to initiate a lockdown, and that's really important for you to understand. It may be that in a situation, you are the first person to observe the threat. The threat might be outside the school, uh, and you're the very first person to see it, and you have the ability to call the school office or radio the school bus office and say, this is this threat, you need to put uh, Lake Hazel Elementary on lockdown. And it doesn't have to be a situation where you call the office and say, hey, can I talk to the principal? And then they try to track the principal down and they can't find the principal. And, and all of this time is going by because you see somebody walking up to a school door carrying an ax or carrying a gun or something to that effect. So you have the ability to initiate a lockdown. Um, the, the key is just getting that information to the school as quickly as possible. In the lockdown, the PA will announce uh, in the school, there will be a PA announcement that will be lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. School staff will secure their classrooms. Uh, which includes locking the door. It may include barricading the entrance and other security measures approved by local officials. Uh, once secured, occupants of the room may be moved to a designated safe area in the room away from views from interior hallways and windows. If protective cover is available, students should be moved behind it. Cover interior windows if practical. And teachers remain calm, reassure students, maintain quiet, be aware of the situation, and keep the move secure defend options open. Um, if in an occupied space, move quickly to secure the room. Uh, if in common spaces, move to available securable spaces and secure it. Uh, if securable space is not readily available, move with students out of the building to a predetermined offsite location, which we talked about. 
If you're outside the building and a lockdown is called, it's probably not best to go into the school. If you're already outside the building, the chances are with a lockdown, the majority of cases, the threat is already in the building or the threat's coming into the building and that's why we're calling it a lockdown. But if the threat's inside or going inside and you're outside the building, the thing that we would like you to do is take yourself and any students that you have and go to a different location. We will find you later. Um, that's not the issue, um, but we don't want you going into the school to secure in a classroom if the threat's already in there. Just leave. Um, don't open any secure doors until it's opened by uh, first responders uh, and the designated all clear signal is given. So whenever a lockdown is called, we have instructed teachers and school staff to not unlock and open the door and unsecure the door uh, for a voice on the outside saying, it's the police, open the door, everything's okay. Uh, what we tell them is that we will be the ones to open the door and give you the all clear. So until that happens, uh, they are not to open the door at all. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're in a school, you're in a classroom, you're in an office, and you're in lockdown, do not open the door until, uh, you don't open the door at all. The police, once we come and everything is fine, they'll be the ones that unlock the door and open the door and have you come out. Following the lockdown, a controlled evacuation may be required uh, and positive student accounting will be completed at an off-site uh, evacuation location. And real quickly, and then you'll see the video, but in a lockdown, it's really simple. What we teach our school staff is if a lockdown is called, is you, you secure all of your students in the classroom. The very first thing that we want you to do is lock the door. Um, there has never been a school shooting where a locked classroom door has been breached by the shooter. There have been situations where the window in the door has been breached, and so that's why we talk about barricading and why that's important. But if you can lock the door, um, that's the best thing that you can do. So in any situation, even for you, if you find yourself in a situation where uh, there's some kind of active shooter or hostile event going on. If you need to secure yourself, locking your door is the most important thing. Shutting the lights off, uh, being quiet, barricading the door. And, and like in this room, um, when we talk about barricading the door, uh, this door has a little window in it, which is similar to what all of our classroom doors look like. There's usually a window uh, there. Putting stuff up in front of that window, uh, making your barricade tall and deep, um, that way, if the bad guy does break out the window, it's going to be really difficult for him to stick his hand in with a gun or something like that. Um, we have them move the students out away from the door. Uh, and then the other thing that happens is we ask all of our teachers to have an improvised weapon. And so if a, if a bad guy does stick his hand through that window, there's a teacher standing nearby with a baseball bat or a golf club or something um, where they're going to act out and they're going to hit that person. So. Uh, this is what a lockdown drill looks like in, in real life. Following the lockdown, a controlled evacuation may be required. Uh, and
The demonstration you're about to watch is a lockdown, one of the Idaho Standard Command responses for schools. A lockdown is only initiated for imminent or active threats of violence occurring inside of a school. School staff members have the duty to care for large numbers of children. So during a lockdown, schools should follow the Move Secure Defend model. The Move Secure Defend model for a lockdown addresses the unique nature of the K-12 school environment. There is an armed person in the building. There's an armed person in the building. Let me call for lockdown. I will call 911. Lockdown in progress. Lockdown in progress. Lockdown in progress. Everybody, can you leave your books? Come quickly and quietly into the classroom, please. During a lockdown, students and school personnel are expected to move away from danger in a safe, controlled, and intentional manner. Staff needs to be aware of surroundings and be ready to make decisions based on their awareness. Teachers and staff need to be trained to secure their class space or other designated area quickly and completely. When securing space, the emphasis is on preventing entry and physical contact between the potential threat and the class rather than only seeking concealment. Once a space has been secured, students move to a designated safe area away from view or behind protective cover. School personnel are not instructed to fight attackers or go on the offensive. Instead, students and other personnel are to defend their space if needed in a controlled manner. School districts are recommended to authorize staff to use improvised weapons or other available means to protect themselves and their classes from imminent harm. All right, ladies, gentlemen, let's go. Grab your stuff. We need to head right up If here. securable space is lot. not Please. readily available, students you. and school personnel should leave the school grounds to a predetermined off-site location. Police department! Police department! After a lockdown is implemented, communications will come as quickly as possible regarding the next steps. During a lockdown, the priorities are to move away from danger in a safe and intentional manner to a place of safety. Secure your space quickly and completely with effective cover and physical barriers. And only when the situation dictates, defend students and staff with all means, including improvised weapons. Experience shows that a secured classroom door is the most effective response to an active threat. So training school personnel to secure space quickly and effectively is the most critical initial response. All school staff should have the authority and the means to institute a lockdown as needed. So that's what a lockdown drill should look like. Um, in that video, the, the only difference is that in the video, the teacher uh, doesn't make that, the barricade's deep, but isn't necessarily tall. And so uh, there are a couple of chairs on top of that table. We want those barricades to be really aggressive. And, um, and, and so in real life scenario, we, if you find yourself needing to barricade uh, yourself or students in a room, um, Anything that you can put in front of that door, put in front of that door. Uh, the next slide, uh, I'm gonna have, we'll probably just pass over. This is more a little bit about the exercise and drill recommendations at schools. We won't necessarily get into that. Um, but here's some additional considerations just to talk to you a little bit about uh, in your role in busing and the, the contact that you have with kids and the time that you do is that buses uh, potentially are safe havens for students fleeing uh, an incident in the school. And so if you find yourself at a school campus and you see students fleeing the school, uh, they're potentially gonna come to you and try to get onto the bus. Uh, and my advice in that situation again is to keep your options open, be situationally aware to what's going on, but if you can get a number of students on the bus and then drive the bus away from the school, that is your best bet. 
Um, un unfortunately, there could be situations where you see students fleeing the school and trying to get onto the bus, and you may have an active threat where you may have a shooter outside the school engaging students uh, or engaging students as they're walking in and you're there. Uh, and you're gonna have to make the tough decision about do I take the students that I have now and leave or do I wait? And I can't tell you what that looks like. Um, that's gonna be a really bad day if that ever happens, but make the best decision that you can and just know that you might have to make that decision where you leave with the kids that you have and you're not gonna be able to take everybody with you. When we teach this, a lot, of, a lot of times one of the questions that comes up from teachers is that if I'm in a classroom and I have my students and there's an active shooter and we go into lockdown and there are students banging on my door, am I supposed to let them in? And the, the response is the same as, as a teacher, that's a very, unfortunately that's, that, it's a really bad day if you have to make the decision of letting kids in or not. And what we talk about is, is if there's a person with a gun right outside the door shooting students and you've got 25 or 30 kids in your classroom, unfortunately you might have to make the tough decision to secure your room and not open it to allow anybody in to protect the kids that you have already in your classroom. So from a busing perspective, um, you're just going to have to be aware of what's going on and if you feel like you have more time and you can get more kids onto the bus before you leave, then great. But you may have to make that tough decision where you take the kids that you have and you leave. Again, it's all about moving away from danger to a place of safety. Uh, and that's just something that you're gonna have to think through. Um, I talked about this with Natalie a little bit at the beginning, and I think this is a discussion that will have to happen more between Cascade and the school district. but. Busing is gonna be really important in uh, a lockdown situation where, especially an active shooter situation, where once the, the threat has been neutralized and now we have everybody locked down, we're not just going to release the whole school uh, all at once. We're, gonna, we're going to physically go and send in teams of law enforcement officers to clear each classroom one by one all of those students, you've probably seen it in the past when you've seen videos of school shootings at other uh, locations across the country when all of the students come out with their hands up with the teacher. And a lot of times you see them being marched out of the school, but you don't really see where they go. And where they're going is to a school bus. And the plan is for, for buses to stage when a critical incident has been reported and as soon as the situation um, is been taken care of and the threat is gone, everything's safe, then the goal would be to have school buses line up and come to the school. And we're gonna we're going to have all of those those kids leave the classroom, um, enter onto the bus. There should be somebody that is uh, taking a roster, making sure they know the name of every kid getting on the bus and off the bus. And essentially all of these kids at the school are going to be bused to a reunification location. And West Ada School District has already identified uh, reunification spots and they would let you know that that reunification spot is going to be determined upon where the critical incident takes place. But for instance, it could be Eagle High School. And so if there's an incident at Rocky, uh, all of the kids would be uh, evacuated from the school. And then they would be placed on two buses Buses would then transport them to Eagle High School where they would uh, go into the school and be accounted for. And then all of the parents uh, would be notified that the reunification spot, the place that you need to go to pick up your kid is Eagle High School, not Rocky where the incident happened. And the school district will, will put that out to parents as quickly as possible because we know that when we have a critical incident at a school, that even if we tell parents, you're not gonna be able to go to the school and see your kids, you have to go to the reunification spot, um, they're still gonna to go to the school, clog up the roadways and all of that. And so um, that's a little bit about what that looks like and there'll be more discussion uh, with you all about that in the future. Uh, and again, if what happens if it is on the bus? What happens if you have a student on the bus with a gun uh, or some type of critical incident on the bus? The move, secure, defend um, principles still apply. Uh, it's important to move you and your students away from the threat as quickly as possible. 
if you can't do that, what can you do to secure your bus to keep anybody from getting on? Uh, and then if you have to get to the point where you, the threat is right there uh, and you have to aggressively defend yourself, then be prepared to do that. And when we talked about mental preparation in the, um, at the beginning of the presentation, it's really important for you to do that uh, with the idea of defending yourself and your students and what that looks like. Um, and again, the other thing to think about from a busing perspective too is, is it a true active shooter situation where in an active shooter, the, the shooter, the, the bad person, they just want to do as much harm as quickly as possible to as many people as possible. Where a hostage situation isn't necessarily, uh, that might not be the goal. And so just be prepared, be aware, and you know, don't get caught asleep at the wheel. Uh, and if it is a hostage situation, you, the, your response might be different at that point. You might need to slow down, think things through. Uh, maybe the person isn't actively trying to hurt people. Um, but in any case, the next step down is you need to communicate the problem as soon as possible. And whether that's a phone call or radioing, radioing into your office, um, would be to please do that. Uh, remembering action beats reaction. Um, make a decision about what you need to do as quickly as possible um, based upon the threat that you have in front of you and then make that decision. And uh, the last thing real quickly I wanted to talk about is report any concerns that you have with students that you have on your bus. You're gonna connect with these kids. You're gonna see them every single day in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, they're gonna connect with you uh, and if you see a kid who's struggling, uh, if you see a kid who's isolating, if you see a kid who's making concerning statements, uh, report that to somebody, either at your office or to the school or the SRO. Um, but the see something, say something uh, cliche that you hear about is really crucial. Um, and interestingly enough, in a sad way, in the majority of school shootings that have happened over the years, uh, we call it leakage. Leakage has occurred in almost every single situation. And what leakage is, is that before that incident happened, there were other people that knew about it. And it was either because the kid told them or shared information with them. Uh, we've had situations before where I actually had uh, an adult teacher and that happened here in, in Ada County in a local school district where an adult teacher had information that a student was talking about committing a shooting at a school and didn't report it to anybody um, because they didn't necessarily believe them. And so my, um, my request to you is that when you hear these things being talked about, uh, when you hear a kid talking about something that's a little off or not quite right uh, or who knows but if you if you see something with one of your kids that feels off then report it let somebody know so that we can engage with that student and see if we can provide um, some help and and it could be that there's really not a lot of stuff going on it's not a big deal but but you run the risk if you don't report it that it is a big deal that something bad happens uh, in the end. So again, report student concerns and um, see something, say something. Um, that's just really important. Um, don't just blow it off as no big deal or blow it off like, you know, this kid would never do anything to hurt anybody. Um, because in the vast majority of instances, these kids tell people, uh, sometimes months in advance, uh, of, what their intentions are. And it's important to um, let somebody know. And it may not come from the student um, who wants to do something bad. It could be coming from other students who come to you and say, you know, Logan has been telling other kids about this, talking like this at the back of the bus. Uh, and so uh, it's just really important to report that. So. We'll leave that alone. I don't want to beat that to death, but it's really important. Uh, and so here are um, some of the patches uh, and some of the, the logos of the agencies that 
uh, helped participate in the um, development of the ISCRS protocols that I just talked to you about. And uh, it was a collaboration of educators, uh, first responders um, from, from Boise Fire, different fire agencies, law enforcement agencies. So um, I hope that, uh, uh, that you learned something today and at least that you know if there's a, a, an incident at a school, this is likely it's going to be handled in one of these four ways. And so if you, you see that going on while you're there, you know what's going on and then you know maybe a little bit better how, how to participate in that process. So here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to call me or email me at any time. And again, the other thing is a lot of times when we have this discussion, there are a lot of scenario-based questions that come up or things that you've experienced in the past that maybe you want to know, how should I have handled this? So uh, please feel free to reach out to me, um, call me. I'm happy to talk to you at any time. Uh, or reach out to any of the SROs at any of your schools at any time. So thank you.